Uh, this is very exciting for me. Uh, I've been a fan of Miss Petzl since Special Topics, and now I get to sit next to her. <laughs> <clears throat> so uh, I thought let's begin with brass tacks. Okay. And uh, why don't you just tell the audience the basic story of night film, of course. if we can boil something. Down to it. If we can boil a humdinger down to basic. <laughs> okay. Um, Night Film is a psychological thriller about three strangers coming together in contemporary Manhattan to investigate a young woman's death. Her father just so happens to be this reclusive cult filmmaker, a man no one has seen in over 30 years, named Stanislas Cordova. And so, over the course of the novel, these three outcasts, in a certain way, uh, inch closer and closer to piecing together the final 10 days of this young woman's life. And they simultaneously get closer to unmasking the true identity of her father. Um, so it, it's, the most, it's the most common question asked, I think, by any touring author, to, I'm asked of any touring author. But how, how did this book even begin to percolate for you? What, 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 were, the, what were the first germs of, its, of an idea? What was its genesis? When, did, when were you uh, struck hard enough by inspiration that you would stay with something as long mm -hmm. as it takes to write a novel? Yes, I mean, I, I do believe that there has to be something um, about a novel, as you say, that is so compelling that it, that attraction for you as the author to that material will last you over the course of writing a novel. And historically, writing a novel for me takes about three years. So I, coming off of special topics, I definitely wanted to take a moment to recharge and think about what it meant for me to be a writer. I think um, after Special Topics, a lot of the time when I was traveling, people would say, good luck on the second novel. And there was a lot of question <laughs> as, to, um, as to what that would be. And the general consensus by everyone around me was that it was going to be very, very difficult to follow up. There's something about the second novel that it has a strange gravitational pull to it. I didn't quite understand until I was um, getting nearer, and it was like a mountain that just seemed so high I couldn't see the top, it was hidden in clouds. Um, so the, my immediate team around me was fantastic because they gave me a lot of freedom, and they really told me to take all the time that I needed, and I took that professional advice and began to build a world, and I started Unlike special topics where I really started with an outline and was, that was very stage managed as a book, I plotted the entire thing. With night film, I began with a mood and a feeling. I wanted a dark odyssey that got darker and darker and something that um, would writhe and twist upon itself and really take characters on a wild ride. But unlike special topics, I knew nothing about what those plot points were. Um, so I allowed myself to drift and really build the world for a long period of time. Of course, I had as a centerpiece this reclusive filmmaker who was entirely underground. Um, unlike any pop cultural figure today, his work was buried. So if you as a fan wanted to experience it, you really had to actively follow the signs and log onto hidden websites to experience the work. Uh, so I started building that history, and it certainly took me a long time to make that very real to myself and understanding the breadth of his work before I realized that the way into the novel was through his daughter. And I felt Cordova was a bit like looking at the sun, that you can't look at him directly. But if you look at the immediate environment around the sun, then you can actually begin to make out how large it is and, and what the gravitational pull is. And the way into the novel was Ashley and um, his daughter's death. That's, re that, that's really interesting because, I, I, I mean, I have found personally that novel writing is, is much more circuitous than people would like to hope. Um, yes. You spend a lot of time writing around right. your subject. And so interestingly in, uh, well, I guess what I would ask is, I know that you 
came up with 15 films, but the oeuvre of yeah. Cordo Cordoba. Cordoba or Cordova? Cordova. Cordova, right. It's like Ricardo Montalban. Ricardo Montalban is Cordova. Okay. <laughs> or the Spanish pronunciation. Right, right, right. Cordova or something like right. that. Right. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, either one. I got my 70s commercials confused. <laughs> but anyway, so you did, so you did uh, 15 of these films, but isn't it true that you actually then subsequently plotted out the films themselves? And was I that, did. so was that, was that pre writing work? Was yes, that part of the atmosphere? Yes, this is part of that drifting that I was just talking okay. about. Um, and I think some people are like, I think my agent would check in and be like, you know, you're not really you're like putting any words on a page. I mean, occasionally there were like <laughs> hints of anxiety, but I was like, okay, I'm just gonna ignore that right now. But I think that I had to, I mean, the, the sort of books that I love, and I think all writers come at writing in terms of what they want to read and what they're smitten by. And it's exactly what you say. It's that um, the writer allowed that creative process to be circuitous and to be irrational at times mm -hmm. and to drift and to, um, and to know that sometimes you go down those dead ends and you throw out those pages and yet they're crucial because they brought you to another point. And you need that. Um, I think if you write in too linear a way, then um, you miss some of the moisture and the mold and some of those um, amazing things that grow out of something that's been sitting percolating for a really long time. Although we don't miss moisture in Nashville. Um, <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, especially today. Um, so le let's talk about this notorious app. Oh, okay. That was created um, for, uh, for, I guess, not just as promotional material, but also as uh, additional material sort of post-reading. And I mean, I don't know if Mr. Peanut has an app, which oh, some of you may. Yeah, it actually oh, okay. it, it kills your spouse. But anyway, so. Um, <laughs> I gotta anyway, check that out. Yeah, well, not so you're married. But anyway, so um, could you talk about how all of this additional curated content, the 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 trailer that you did? Yes. And, and as well as, again, the writing, for those of you, when you look through Night Film, you, you're, you're given not just text, I, I mean, the, the novel proper, but you also have screenshots and you know, flashes into internet chat rooms and things that sort of mimic a kind of Google search about this filmmaker. And I, I'm, I'm curious about what that says both about what you were trying to do formally, and I'm also curious about in what order you did that. Okay. The chicken or the egg? Okay. So when I first conceived Night Film and I was writing, or my agent, I was discussing it with my mom and my agent, and um, Night Film always had this visual voyeuristic scrapbook quality. And rather than turning in an outline of what I foresaw the novel to be, I turned in to her newspaper articles and different notes and photographs and different visual materials that started giving life to these absent characters, this filmmaker and his daughter. So Night Film always had this scrapbook quality. I think it's because originally I thought I might write an epistolary novel. I had always been um, interested in that form of how letters give rise to really volcanic stories. Mm -hmm. um, but at the time, uh, when I was writing it, I thought that the epistolary novel was a little bit outdated. So from that point, I just started compiling these visual materials and writing within these different voices. And that was really, I, mean, I even had the, um, the obituary from the New York Times starting to build this novel. So Night Film really always had that quality. And when I was starting the actual writing, I curated each piece, knowing that the best books that we read leave so much to the imagination and they allow readers to really submerge in the world and nothing can take you out of it. And certainly a visual can intrude upon that imaginative experience. So each one I designed hopefully to give readers a tactile visual sense of what Cordova's world was. And these people are situated in a pop cultural landscape. So allowing readers to feel that in a really active way and to draw from all those different voices their own conclusions along with the main characters. Um, I also wanted 
the visuals to come at a time in the narrative where readers might be able to take a break. Mm -hmm. So it was almost like a respite from the reading experience. Mm -hmm. They'd be able to suddenly peruse a police report, which I think voyeuristically in this like CSI world, we really, those stories are really compelling to be able to read the police report and to show it to readers in an active way rather than me simply telling it um, seemed more powerful to me. So that was always walking a fine line between in to giving rise to this visual world and not intruding too much on the reader's imagination. Um, but it was really after I turned in the novel, a Random House came to me with the idea for an app. Mm -hmm. So that was building the material myself and deciding what threads of stories within night film we would blow up into the app. I mean, everything within the app is peripheral. So if you never download the app, you still, and just read the book, you have the heart of night film. But there are a few tiny mysteries within the book that if you download the app, you can experience what happens and find out um, clues and endings to some of the, the threads and the smaller mysteries within night film. But that was always after I had turned in the novel. Excellent. Uh, so <clears throat> Cordova's films being uh, about as dark as they come, or so dark in a way that they're, all, they're, they're, they're kind of indescribable, mm -hmm. right? Um, tell us about some of your favorite truly terrifying movies, um, the, the ones that were maybe in the air. Uh, as you were writing the novel, because you know, I was I, so when I was reading, I'll throw out one of mine, and I, this is a, a movie that it was truly terrifying to me as a kid, and that I never recovered from. But I think you alluded to right at the beginning of the novel, which is Nicholas Rogue's film of now. Yes, exactly. And no, the, terrifying. Right, but yes. the girl in the—I mean, seeing Ashley in the red. Well, oddly enough, I never found out about that film until I had, after I had written Night Film. And, um, but no, you're absolutely right. In terms of what terrifies me. But I mean, I guess, cause, but, or, I mean, but I guess what I mean is there, there, there are films, there are films like that. Another one would be uh, irreversible. Yeah. I mean, I mean, movies that, that truly movies that are where, where the viewer or a, a, a cinephile or just someone who knows anything about cinema maybe says before they see it, I don't know if I can see that movie or it, it exudes the same kind of power that Mm -hmm. your main character does. See what mm -hmm. I'm saying? Yeah. So what kind of movies, I mean? I thought in terms of early Polanski, Repulsion, mm -hmm. um, Knife in the Water, I am much more afraid of terror movies than horror movies. Because mm -hmm. terror is anxiety and fear over what you think you're about to see or encounter, mm -hmm. while horror is revulsion and being scared over something that you have just seen and it's very overt and in your face. Mm -hmm. And I obviously find terror so much more terrifying than horror. Um, so horror movies, of course, like Saw and Hostel aren't really scary for me because it's so obvious. But it's what we don't see, like repulsion, um, like irreversible, this like pull that you know is coming and it's going to be laid bare for you and you're not sure if you can survive it. That's what's terrifying. Have you seen Session 9? I have, so, I have, that's a good yes. One. I mean, over the course of night film, I certainly watched everything. And I had done or everything that people were talking about in terms of like the scariest movie ever made. And um, I think that... Watch some Japanese. What? Uh, oh, did you watch course. some of the Japanese? Oh, uh, like, uh, have you ever like the seen audition? audition? Yeah, audition. <laughs> I was just about to say. If, everyone, if everyone really wants to mess up their kids, put them in front of audition with the babysitter. Yeah. Or there's also something called nurse. I love these Japanese <laughs> movies. It's just nurse, audition. And then it's like these things on steroids with a lot of blood. A lot of like, okay, you don't think it can get any worse. And then it does. Uh, but <laughs> I think it's always, I mean, I always found repulsion so terrifying simply because of the, the, the time that the camera takes. I mean, they always say that the director's eye is really the camera. So when you're following a camera panning through Catherine Deneuve's apartment and you know she's slowly going mad and becoming hom homicidal, um, the camera just snakes through and takes its time and lovingly pans down the bed. And then um, you come across Catherine Deneuve's hand, which is sticking out from under the bed. And you know she's hiding under there, waiting for someone to come home. And, and then it slips over the rabbit, which is decomposing, and which she was going to cook earlier, earlier in the week. And, 
um, those are the moments of like encroaching danger that are so mesmerizing. Uh, so I'm going to paraphrase this bit from your book's trailer, but I'm not going to do the guy's accent. <laughs> As a director, Cordova occupies a unique place in the film world. People either love him or they're too terrified to see his movies. He's a threat to society because he isn't selling anything. So is the artist, is the artist still subversive enough to be a threat to society or put in, into literary terms? Does the writer of literature have a large enough audience to be revolutionary? Or, or in night film, by ceding sort of the drama to the, the work of a, of a filmmaker, mm -hmm. is it only cinema that has that kind of subversive power? Or because of all the sampling of the internet, is it only the internet that has that subversive power? You know, I mean. I just That's think it's a, a very interesting That's statement. A he's, a, he's a threat to society because he isn't selling yes. anything. What do you mean? Well, I think you have to take commerce away from art. If you go back to the era of the Medicis, artists did not have to survive, and they didn't care about selling anything, and they would have benefactors. And that's how uh, we gave birth in Western civilization to some of the most incredible art, because they didn't have to sell their paintings. I mean, of course, this changed, but um, I certainly wanted to explore that in some way, because I was growing tired of this endless cycle of movies coming out on the weekend, and the actors you know, doing Letterman and Jay Leno, and I started to wonder why there aren't more recesses. Why isn't the topography stranger? And um, I think that, I mean, well, I, think well, art wait, wait, is, saying, I think art always can be subversive. But, but you're, yes, but you're saying, you're, in a way, you're saying right now there isn't a Cordova, right? Yes, I am. Yeah. But there could be. <laughs> no, there could be. No, 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 Let's no. But right you know now. what I mean. Like, I mean, it's it's mm -hmm. it's it, 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 it's an interesting comment within the book. That yes. The, that in our society right now there isn't a Cordova. That that there isn't someone who can really that can that can shock us so badly, or is that subversive that he's untouched? No, like even I mean. Uh, Lars Van Trier still gets, mm -hmm. you know, wide release. You know what I'm saying? He does, yes, yes. And I think, I mean, maybe there is a Cordova, but you're right. If, he's, if, if he does exist, he's so far on the periphery, no one knows who on right. earth he is. So right. he doesn't have this underground following, and he doesn't have uh, people dying to see his films. Right, because when you hear Kirsten Dunst talking on NPR about a Lars Van Trier film she's in, it's not... <laughs> I know. That's the whole it thing. It's like, so why nice can't there be so more? Disturbing. I know, I know. Yeah. And even when you go to independent film or... I mean, maybe... I, th I do think that there is hope in the sense that we can get off of this commercialized version of art because the paradigm is certainly changing in the sense that anyone can be an author now. Anyone can be a filmmaker. The only stopping, the only thing stopping you is the is your own ability to tell a compelling story. You can have your own series now. You can have your own YouTube channel. You mm -hmm. don't need you don't have you don't need this corporation telling you if you're allowed in or not. I mean, mm -hmm. now with Amazon self-publishing, with um, YouTube, anyone can be a filmmaker. Mm -hmm. So I hope that this will give rise to a really interesting new dynamic of content that um, doesn't need to go through this sort of um, poli over-polished, over-drawn sort of c cycle. Mm -hmm. um, so that's my hope. OK. <laughs> I, 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 I hope, too. Um, <laughs> uh, so to, to be terrified, says Cordova, to be scared out of your skin, was the beginning of freedom, mm -hmm. of opening your eyes to what was graphic and dark and gorgeous about life, thereby conquering the monsters of your mind. So my question is, can't we just do this through therapy? <laughs> like a daily regimen of exercise? No, because then you can just Prozac. talk circuitously forever and never solve anything. Um, but talk but, about that quote a little. OK, well, Cordova means that when you are terrified, it's a really quick way to be immediately lodged into the present 
and dialed into your surroundings. And when you're in the present, um, you're tethered to the world in a way that you're normally not. And it's, it, fear for him is a way to jolt us out of numbness and out of a routine. And um, that is a gateway for self-discovery. Is, is that the way that um, Cordova, Cordova, <laughs> Cordova. Cordova. And, 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 our, and, our, and our investigative reporter are sort of alike in the way in which he's sort of a Luddite, you know? I mean, you know yes. how, he's, how he's a Luddite, how he, he is, he's, yeah. anti, he's not anti-technological, but he's, he's a bumbler technologically. Yeah. So in a way, so there's sort of, there's a parody there. Well, he's getting lost, obviously. And there are still people who, I mean, I was one. I never was connected to Facebook, really, or Twitter until I knew that I was finished with Night Film and that my publisher would want me to be. But um, yes, I mean, I think the book is, the foundation of the book is that constant pull between um, the need to get lost as human beings and the need to connect and the need to be unknown and inscrutable and the need to expose yourself and mm -hmm. to tell a story. Mm -hmm. um, so all of those are constant shifting dynamics. That was part of the mystery of what I was trying to figure out in the course of writing. Okay, so here are two quotes. The first is from Night Film and the second is from Special Topics. Oh, did I repeat myself? No, no, no. <laughs> Which is, which is the audience knows, huge clunker, special topics. <laughs> Cover of New York Times book review, published in 30 countries. Total bomb. Um, so here's, here's a quote from Night Film. Okay. The fact that out of all potential pseudonyms, Ashley Cordova had chosen that one, a missing woman in her father's film, led to all sorts of psychological conclusions, the most obvious being that her father's stories were part of her day-to-day -day reality, maybe overshadowed her sense of self. Now here's special topics. A professor puts a veritable frame around life and organizes the unorganizable, nimbly partitions it into modern and postmodern, Renaissance, Baroque, primitivism, imperialism, and so on. Splice that up with research papers, vacation, midterms, all that order, simply divine. So what's the deal with super dominant dads in your book? And, 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 and do you have some skeletons in your closet, Brescia? I mean, <laughs> yeah, I as, but I want you to discuss this theme okay. of the protagonist who's eclipsed by another narrative, right? The, or, I mean, you know, Ashley yes. in some ways is dominated by her father's narrative mm -hmm. in the same way Blue Van Meer mm -hmm. is dominated by yes. her father's narrative. Did you, have you noticed that? Are you aware of that? <laughs> is this that? a personal question? Well, I never think in those terms, and I know this has come up now that I've been on tour, and I think that I started with someone mad to create and mad to live in a very full way, and the fallout of human relationships around such a person. And the fact that it was two men just seems completely arbitrary from my point of view. <laughs> it could easily have been a woman. So now for my third novel, I certainly have to have an all-powerful woman just to prove that there's nothing, no skeleton in any closet. Um, but I think that, I mean, especially with night film, I mean, Gareth has his own issues, who's the professor that you're talking about. Mm -hmm. but. Um, I, was, I had read so many biographies, obviously about Kubrick when I was researching this filmmaker, but I also read a lot about uh, Picasso and other artists and how um, people around them lived and um, how they suffered and how they were empowered and how they were used in a certain way and how the children um, were able to grow up around such a person. And just all of those dynamics um, were really interesting to me, and I wanted to investigate them. But it, in terms of a personal graph oh, I wasn't, from my no, no, own no. life. I wasn't, please, I wasn't getting personal. I don't <laughs> want you to overshare. I, I just, I, I mean, but it's interesting to me about, again, from a narrative side mm -hmm. and a psychological side, when a character is overdetermined by another narrative and it creates suspense in that they have to break out of that controlling narrative. I mean, in some they ways, do. both, both
both of your protagonists deal with that problem, breaking out of a controlling narrative. Yes, and there are the planets revolving around that sun and um, what that means and how they handle that. Um, so 15 movies within a novel. Have you got a movie deal yet? For Nightbound. Yes. yes, yes. It's an option cool. by Peter Turnin Entertainment through 20th Century Fox. Awesome. And they have attached a director, Rupert Wyatt, who directed Rise of the Planet of the Apes. And he's an incredible director, very up and coming, and he's British. And, um, but part of the film deal was that I would be able to explore and mine on my, in whatever way I saw fit, those 15 Cordova films. Mm -hmm. uh, because I went through the process of creating them and knowing certain scenes within each one, so I might use them in another way. So that's also in my little grab bag of ideas. <laughs> Excellent. Well, on that very successful note, I think, I, I think I'll turn questions over to the audience. Um, and all I would ask is that you speak up so that other people in the audience can hear your questions. Don't be shy. Don't be shy, please. There have to be some writers and readers in here. Yes. Oh, good. So, sort of Jonathan Stafford Froh's work is also sort of uses this multimedia approach and yeah. I'm sure a ton of other really interesting writers nowadays. And I guess I'm interested in your thoughts on on sort of books that are literary and books that are, are popular, you know what I mean? Like popular fiction and the overlap between them, which I think a lot of these books mm -hmm. do, do have that sort of appeal and... Um, I guess just just whether you think the the line in literature is so is is you know so sharp that that books that that do have you know a large audience like like you were saying about like art being um, sort of subversive in society versus versus books that are I don't know just do you know what I mean? Is my question. Well, are you asking me if is there a fine line between literary and commercial, or do I even think in those terms? I yeah, I guess. Okay. Do, do you think in those terms at all, and does it influence how you write? I don't. I don't. I like to throw out all classification or any kind of professorial like situ, situating myself in any term in a, any larger context of a movement. Or I think once you start thinking in these grand terms, you're writing. Um, suffers. I like to just throw all of that out, not even thinking in terms of what their reaction will be, and then just focusing on the story that is compelling. And for me, it's character and setting and story. And whether it's literary or commercial or any of those divisions, even it's not really my place to say. I think that, um, that that's for someone else to decide. Um, who are your favorite authors and, and what are some of your favorite books? Um, I would say my favorite author of all time is Truman Capote. But I certainly, and over the course of writing Night Film, he was the author that I read the most. I, but not only his novels and um, In Cold Blood, but I read a lot of his letters and his interviews and um, his short stories and really going deep on his art, but also how his personality was like infused and he was this larger than life character and, um, and how he was so much a paradox too. He could be vicious, he could also be like a, a child. And um, so I would say that he was the writer that I read the most. But I read everything, everything from pot boilers, like 19, um, like old mysteries like Raymond Chandler, even Agatha Christie. Um, I grew up reading mysteries. My grandmother would always give me mysteries for my birthday, and she'd give me like 20 of them, um, like Dorothy Sayers and all these British mystery writers. So that was uh, her influence on me. Um, but then I, I love literary fiction. I love Jen Egan and um, 
like, uh, let's see, I love Adam Ross, actually. <laughs> He's really good. Um, like, so yeah, I like to get my hands on as much as possible and, um, and like have all of those voices cheering me on in my head. I was cheering you on. Okay, you were, yeah. <laughs> I'm gonna, <clears throat> I'm gonna inspire, <clears throat> sorry. I am, a, I wanna be a novelist. Um, oh, wonderful. I'm aspiring novelist. Um, what, what's your writing process like? Do you write every day? Do you write every few days? Do you research mostly a lot? And um, what kind of tips do you have for aspiring writers? Oh gosh, I would say the most crucial thing, if you make a commitment to being a novelist, um, for me, and the only reason I'm published is that I never let anyone dissuade me from the fact that I was going to be a novelist. Um, the most crucial thing for me it was writing every single day. Every single day minus Friday, and, or minus Saturday and Sunday, because I did need to have a life. But um, I write Monday through Friday, nine to four. Of course, when you're a struggling writer, you need to live. So I would fit my writing into any hour that I had free. I worked as a consultant before I published special topics. So I would write at work. I mean, I was mad to become published. I also got into the habit of always finishing what I started. Because I knew so many people of my own age who had ideas for novels and they would certainly start and they would never finish. And I was terrified by that prospect. So when I set out on something, I would always finish it, even if I knew it did not work. At that point, I would also always send it out for professional feedback. I wouldn't give it to my friends. I wouldn't give it to even my professors. I sent it out to know just what people who actually deal in the book world would say. And I, I got universally rejected in my first two novels. Um, I, some of the rejections would just be a, a, mim, a mimeograph, this is like going way back, uh, a letter. <laughs> <laughs> and they would just say, thank you for your submission, it's not for the blah blah literary agency. But occasionally, um, there would be an agent who was very generous with her or his time and would say on page you know, 752, Paragraph three, you actually show some promise. <laughs> and right here, um, there's, there's a kernel of talent and there's a kernel of possibility. So I would immediately go to that paragraph and be like, okay, this, you know, this is everything. And um, I think determination is what is so crucial. If this is something you want to do, you can do it. Um, I did not have any contacts. I didn't do an MFA program because I didn't want to spend the money. I, I didn't want to, um, I thought that I could just um, teach myself. And um, the wonderful thing about publishing is that they are always looking for an incredible story, an incredible voice, which is not true of other arts. Like in film, they really are not looking um, for the, the sheer volume of people. They're not searching that haystack for the needle. But in publishing, they are always looking for an incredible new voice, and they're on the lookout for you. So it's up to you to take your story as far as you possibly can. There are no shortcuts. You have to write and write and write. And I honestly think um, if I divide the number of hours that I have spent writing my entire life into what I've made off of writing, it would be like 0.5 uh -huh. cents an hour or something. <laughs> because yeah. I have spent my life writing. But if it's a joy, it's a difficult work, but it's the most fulfilling kind of work, I think that you would agree. I would agree. I would say, though, don't write at work if you're a first responder. <laughs> yes. Or in air traffic control. Exactly. Yes, <laughs> definitely air traffic control. <laughs> right. Uh -huh. Sir? Will you go back to those two books? Never. No, no. So, so if it does, there's no, you don't think there's anything that you could do to they're, they weren't published for a reason, which means they were really bad. Um, one was basically a weird hybrid of like a film noir. So it was kind of a weird hybrid between night film and special topics, like a film noir. It was like 200 pages. Um, but I think like there were two sentences that an agent like circled and was like, this is an interesting voice that try like this little sentence here. And then the second novel that I wrote was a Southern novel because I grew up in Asheville, North Carolina. 
and uh, was influenced by a lot of stories there growing up. So I might write a Southern novel eventually, but it's certainly not the second novel that I wrote called Moving Furniture, which is a terrible title because no one <laughs> likes to move. <laughs> Moving is like the worst experience ever. So yeah. So no, these are all, I mean, these are all works in progress and getting yourself, it's like training like an athlete, being a novelist. And you have to log so many, or being a swimmer, you have to log so many a lapse in the pool before you even begin to have a great form. That's the extent of my swimming knowledge. <laughs> yes. Your first book was copyrighted in 2006. This book is copyrighted 2013. Can you write a little faster? I'm about to run out of time. I know. I, I want to be here I, for the I'm next one. I'm working on that. I well, I did. The time went really fast. I think I never had a moment of writer's block or anything like that. I do. I did a lot of thinking, and That's certainly coming off the tumult of special topics, I traveled for a year for that book, and I was completely out of shape as a novelist when I sat down to begin my second. It took so much time to get back into that writing mode and that creative mode and um, how you work on something that is going to last you three years. So it took, I was a little flabby. I needed to like get back into that athlete's mode of mentality and being able to create um, and get into that fantasy world. So it took some time, but I have started my next two books. So I, at least looking back, I've gotten a bit of a jump. So, but no guarantees, because I will never release anything that I didn't feel was worthy of other people reading. Got time for one more? Um, okay, so I haven't read your book yet, uh, but you were talking about subversive filmmakers and terrifying films, and I, the first thing I thought of was David Lynch and in Inland Empire. Mm -hmm. Absolutely terrified me, but at the same time, I felt, especially by the end of the movie, more connected to like you said, that immediate moment. And of course, I absolutely love Knife in the Water, Repulsion. Oh, have yeah. you seen Inland Empire? I have terrify you? <laughs> I haven't. I'm a David Lynch fan, and um, my sister recently told me to watch that, but I haven't watched it. Um, but I love Twin Peaks and... Um, Mulholland Drive. Mulholland Drive. And has any movie ever been more, I mean... And every, like... Blue Velvet, Dead dream. Blue Velvet rocked my world right. like no film had at the time. I'd never been so unsettled. Yeah. And I recently went back and watched Twin Peaks and just the way and that Bodley Amenti score and just how oh, you could just like stay in Twin Peaks forever because it's so strange and so <laughs> beautiful and that giant is really freaky. <laughs> <laughs> And the red room, of course, which you don't really want to go into, but then yet you do. Let's give Miss Pestle a hand, please. Thank you all so much. It was wonderful. Thank you.